one house a year could change your life. There's so many ways to do this. And you bought one a year for 10 years, that's $2 million worth of real estate. And you can pay it down and you're a millionaire. It's not complicated. It's just a matter of doing the thing over and over. to Crafted Entrepreneur. I'm super excited because today we have Nathan Brooks on the podcast. He's going to share why he thinks it's easier to make a $10 million deal than a $100,000 deal. He is the CEO and co-founder of Bridge Turnkey Investments. We dive into everything from tips for new investors, how to know what type of business you want to build based on the roles you want to fill, and what led him to making his first seven-figure netting deal. So Nathan is a dad, husband, real estate investor, speaker, and now author. He's also an MMA junkie. (laughs) So we're going to talk about all of the things today. Nathan, welcome to the show. Kayla, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Okay. So what got you started in real estate? Well, I actually made my living and started as a musician from fifth grade. I was actually a professional musician for about a decade, playing bass, piano, guitar, and conducting choirs, and had my song on the radio. Oh, wow. Um, What song? Well, it wasn't, it was regionally here, so I'm sure people probably wouldn't know what what it was or whatever, but um, it was pretty cool to have it, you like, have your stuff played, and... um, Was it like country? Because you're from Kansas City. What was... It was like, like soul rock. Like I've I've been a huge Dave Matthews band, John Mayer, like in that, in that vein. So I love music and I still love music to this day, but I, you know, it's kind of hard to make a living at that, at least a good one. And so (laughs) it's probably not predictable. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Around that uh, time, like playing music, been playing a while And um, both like in the church world and in like the bar scene too. So I've done both like leading worship as well as doing the, I was actually- That's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, right? I was actually one of the worship leaders at, uh, it's called Church of Resurrection. It's the largest United Methodist church in the US, which is here in Kansas City. That's awesome. My husband used to be a worship leader too. So that's- Is that right? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Hilarious. So- as you know, lots of hours. You, you know, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful, you know, gift, but it's also, you know, it's hard to make a great living. And so like everybody or 99% of the people in real estate, I found, you know, rich dad, poor dad, uh, you know, I was sitting in a restaurant, overheard a guy talking about real estate. Three weeks later, I'm like in business with this guy. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. So you meet this guy, like, and you just start doing business with him three weeks later. How does that work? Not well. (laughs) Oh my gosh. But you're here today to tell us to not do that. So you've obviously learned. (laughs) Yes, I have. I have learned that and many other, uh, you know, decisively bad choices that I made. So I got into business the first day I bought a house. I bought two. I completed everything wrong you can possibly do. I somehow managed to buy a few more. And December of 09 went through bankruptcy after having some serious issues of like trying to get this thing, like enough, enough things wrong, enough, you know, screw ups and bad luck and all the things together. Were you just like over leveraged or what happened in 2009 to lead to bankruptcy? Yeah, I was over leveraged and also, you know, having trouble keeping properties leased. So we kept having, um, issues with that. And I hadn't bought well, I didn't underwrite well, we didn't rehab well, like we, we didn't have enough cash. So there was, there was a lot of things that we did not do well in that, in that scenario. And yeah, it was, that was a tough experience. Wow. Okay. So I love to talk about my mistakes, especially on the podcast, because everybody gets to learn from them. Sure. So what would you say, like looking back, what were the mistakes that we could teach everybody that's listening in right now to not make? Sure. Well, I think having a clear understanding of what you're buying is important. And if you don't know, you should have somebody that's helping you. 
so, you know, having, having a mentor, having a coach, having a partner, somebody that knows, you know, what they're doing. And, you know, I think that was part of the, the blessing and also part of the pain was the ready, fire, aim. Some people have, it's easy to take action, but they don't have a clear plan. Some people it takes them forever. They analysis, paralysis, everything. And for me, it was definitely the ready, fire, aim, go too fast, too many houses, not enough, like you have to learn from one house, learn from the next house, you know, and, and gather that information. Create processes. Yeah. Create processes. And also just understanding like, what are you buying? How are you buying it? Like in what area are you buying? Why are you buying it? And so, you know, those things were hard lessons to learn, but also that have, they've served me well in, in, subsequent, you know, deals too. So when you're saying, you know, having a mentor, having a partner, you, you kind of started off with a partner and it didn't go well. What what do you look for when you decide to partner and do a deal with somebody? What are some things you want in a partner? And then on the other Mm -hmm. side of that, what are some red flags that go, okay, I want to stay away from this type of partner. Sure. That's great. And I, I've had a lot of partners over the years for whatever reason, I, I've been, I've kind of just leaned towards that. I enjoy that. The things I look for are people who have shared values. So it, it's, I think it's oftentimes it's value, it's drive, it's similar size goals. So if you have somebody who wants to do five deals a year and somebody who wants to do a hundred deals a year, two very different problems, right? Yep. And then also risk tolerance what I found is the more clear you make the objective, the less it becomes risky. And it's more about planning and not that you couldn't be risky, but it's about making it clear, like making the the problem clear. And I'd also say on a partnership side, you want to have the divorce up front, like have a clear, you, you and I, Kayla, where we go to business together. It's not that we expect there to be a business divorce, but we, we plan it ahead of time. And we write it out and we have it legal. And, you know, I go into business in those partnerships like it would be on a handshake, but with the backing of, you know, having it legally written out and, and set up. Such good advice. People don't like to talk about if things go wrong or if there's a breakup or something, but it's so good to get that like awkward conversation out of the way in the beginning. So if it does come to that, you're like, okay, you know, there's no hurt feelings um, and you just can exit amicably. So exactly, you had a rocky start in the beginning of your real estate investing journey. Yeah, what helped you stick to it and stay in the real estate game? You know, fifteen years later, you're here and you're thriving. You know, I I distinctly remember sitting there, like in the courthouse, and thinking like this is just this is the most miserable thing. But how can I go through all of this? experience and not utilize it as a tool to help me do better next time. And so, you know, I, and I remember having this conversation with my wife and she's like, you want to do what? Like, that's crazy. Like we, we've already dealt with the pain. We've already, you know, we've gone through this. And so, but I, I knew that that was something that was ex- not only exciting to me, but was a vehicle that would actually work. And so it's not about what has happened in the past because we can't do anything about it, but we can utilize that as a tool. We can utilize it as a lesson, utilize it as, you know, fire to fuel you to make a different choice the next time. So I had to. You had to. <laughs> so, okay, you had to. You have this mindset of like, this is what makes you happy. You want to do it. How did you go from those? first few properties to building turnkey investments, what you have today? It was really kind of an organic thing where, hey, let's do it. I did some more joint ventures. I ended up meeting a business partner. I had the fortune, good fortune of being on Bigger Pockets podcast a couple of times and um, just getting some exposure there. And so I had the good fortune of having multiple people to do deals with. And really one partnership just stuck and he had we had met on on bigger pockets he'd flown out we talked and all of a sudden we realized there was this desire and demand for that 
turnkey kind of product. Now, in hindsight, as I think about it today, I got into real estate not to sell a bunch of houses, but to build wealth. And so I've really changed my feeling about that a lot. And I, you know, I don't actively flip hundreds of houses a year uh, to sell to other people. I'm, I have a smaller uh, operation and I'm all about the wealth building mode, but that's what got us in there was the realization that there's a lot of people who want to own real estate and they, they might've still read the book. They might've still had that, you know, passion for it, but they didn't go figure out all those pieces. And so we were able to solve that for them. Okay. So explain that to everybody because my listeners are new to the real estate investing world. So they're going, okay, what does that mean? (laughs) Perfect. So what we did was we bought the house, we renovated it, we placed a tenant in it and we sold it to them as a quote unquote turnkey investment. The problem is people who hear turnkey also think perfect and there's no perfect real estate. There's no perfect tenant. There's no perfect house. And so, you know, and in the hindsight, any investor needs to realize this, like we need to prepare and plan that there are things that happen. Things break, tenants break stuff, things just happen. You know what I mean? And so that was another pain point of, of that where you had, there, it's such a high level of work. It's such a high level of operation. And, and so, you know, frankly, I, I really sometimes didn't feel there was an appreciation for the level of time and effort it is to go in there and flip 150 houses in a year. It's, it's a lot. And, um, and so as I look at it now and for the listener thinking about this too, and 150 houses might seem crazy. It's like, well, one house a year could change your life. Literally, like you could buy one this year and you get a girl, girlfriends or, or guy friends or whatever, they rent your rooms, you pay for your house, do it again next year, go put 5% more down, get an FHA loan or a conventional 5% loan down. Or if you're military, VA loan, right? There's so many ways to do this. And you bought one a year for 10 years. It, you know, most markets, the average house is 150, 200 grand. That's $2 million worth of real estate. And you can pay it down and you're a millionaire. It's not complicated. It's just a matter of doing the thing over and over. Being consistent, having that muscle to invest your money into your future and not into the yeah. short-term stuff that society says is cool. You know, the like exactly. the upgrades and the things that are yeah. liabilities. Yeah. And it's easy to do. Right. And I, I'm sure you're better at this than me, but I'm guilty too. Right. And I, and, but it's interesting as we make our goal more clear, it's easier to also say no to the other stuff. Absolutely. When you have that commitment level to your vision, right? It's easy to go, oh no, I don't want it anymore. I definitely made a lot of, when I first started making money in my early twenties, I spent it as fast as it came in because that was, that was my financial intelligence at the moment. I'm yeah. like, if it's in your pocket, you spend it. And then I learned really quickly. It's not fun to chase more money. Let's make this money work for us. So yes. what is your personal favorite type of deal that you own in your personal portfolio? Well, we have both short-term uh, rentals and we have long-term rentals. I really enjoy the short-term rentals because there's a really cool creative and design aspect that I really appreciate, like having a cool house, cool stuff, like beautiful space. Where do you own your um, short-term rentals? I have uh, quite a few in Kansas City, and then we have uh, a growing portfolio of them in Texas, South Texas as well. So in Kansas City, is is the theme there? Would it be like the football and that kind of like crowd? Is that who you're attracting? Well, you know, we, what we've done is we kind of take the, let the house talk to us. So if oh. it's, if that's a, a little maybe woo, house woo woo. But so like, for instance, our best performing house, we bought it for 330,000. We put a hundred grand into it. It was worth about 540 is 5,000 square feet with a pool and has this huge basement area that had this like old school brick bar thing, like a wandering bar. And so the designer was like, well, hey, this, like let's do an English pub theme. And so we did like poker table and shuffleboard and pool table. And it has a that big bar and le- leather chairs. And, you know, so 
we didn't have to change the house. We just took what the house gave us and, and really made it cool. That one house will do over a hundred grand gross a year in revenue. So it's, that's why I always also like those short-term rentals because we've, when we get them dialed in, we get them in the right place. They're an outsized return for the, for the property that we are buying. So much bigger. Okay. So you're, it's, you're getting me excited because I know I need to get into short-term rentals and we did it one time with like our personal cabin up in the mountains. And we said no dogs and people like kept bringing their dogs and peeing everywhere. And I was like, ah, I'm done with this. And so I've just been like completely like anti short-term rentals ever since then. But I like the idea of, you know, coming in and having the design and making it like the have a house theme. And I've seen people do that and be successful. So talk to me about like the pros and the cons, right? So the pros are like, you're going to make a lot more money if you, if you go the short-term rental route, the thing that scares me is the, the permit situation. And I'm like, okay, I just focus over here on just the long-term rental and flipping because that's what I know. But yep. there's it's there's so much like, you know, money to be made and fun to be had, I think, in that <laughs> in that area. Yes. So and to the response of the previous question also that the second being that burst strategy by renovate, rent, refinance, like I love that. You can still do it, by the way. It's it's still a, a still a thing. People say that you can't get deals out there, they're lying. It's not true. From the design perspective. And like the solving problem, first of all, it's a little bit more to manage and get it up and running, right? Because you have, you know, let's say you, you expected your, your budget for your construction and, you know, let's say it's $200,000 house, you put $50,000 into it for renovation, but then you also have 20,000 or 25,000 in furniture. It's a lot of money, right? It's a big chunk of money to invest. So make sure you account for that. Because uh, it's hard to have an Airbnb without furniture. <laughs> they really like their beds, okay, Kayla? Beds, <laughs> glasses, dishes, they're important. The positive side is outsized returns can be outsized returns. There's also a cool factor. So if you want to own a house in the ca- a cabin in the mountains, you want to own a, a beach house, you want to own a mountain house, whatever, you can totally buy it now, Airbnb it, assuming it's in a place that you know, allows you legally to do that and, you know, pay off your, pay off your mountain house, go buy one in, uh, you know, where you want it to be. Uh, and then we mentioned this some, but if you get the right comps with the right property, right area, the the return is far larger than a a long-term rental. The downside that you mentioned one, which is, you know, regulation, even in Kansas city here, all of a sudden the city up in, passed a law that said no more Airbnbs in Kansas city. Uh, there's, it's a big, long, crazy thing, but, um, (laughs) and there's a lawsuit going down about it right now because, uh, they, they actually denied a bunch of legal fully filled out applications prior to passing this law as well, which is crazy, but we got to be careful, right? So look for markets that have already made decisions on short-term rental whatever they are, if they've, at least there's a decision, we know what their decision is. We know the good or the bad. That's like in Newport beach where I live. Like it has to be longer than 30, 30 days. Yep. It has to be longer than 30 days. So like, for instance, here's, here's one example that we, we plan on it being a short term stay. So like, you know, less than 30 days, but it's in a killer area. We bought a great house. Uh, it's not one that most people would just go buy as a rental because it's a higher price point like a more luxury kind of market luxury here is like half a million to a million. I'm sure luxury there is like a gajillion. Uh, but but, uh, in any case, so this house, this house is in a really cool part of town, highly desirable and come to find out the, the neighborhood had passed a law or passed an ordinance or whatever for the no short-term rentals. So we flipped it to a midterm rental, which was, you know, 30 day plus, put it on Zillow and it, it, it's normal rent would be like 4,000 a month. And we got $5,800 a month for it in 18 hours in a three or four month stay. So by a great house in a great location, you know, I think the people who are really feeling the Airbnb pain right now are the ones that did the lease arbitrage, which that's a $2 word. 
that means Kayla owns a house. I rent it from her. I furnish it and I put it on Airbnb. So it can be difficult if you have the arbitrage because now you have to make sure you're covering both the lease uh, responsibility as well as the management and, and, you know, short, short term rental side of that. The other thing is everybody like and their mother had the thousand square foot ranch with a, you know, two bedroom or three bedroom, one, you know, one car garage, one bathroom, basic house. And of course, if you have a thousand basic houses, they all look the same. And then it's a race to the bottom for the price. My house, you know, has six bedrooms and we have corporate stays all the time and we have girls weekend and it's a destination that it's created by itself. So you want to be really thoughtful on the best performing houses we have. We created the destination. We we created the demand. The house we just finished in Texas, it's almost 4,000 square feet, five bedrooms, huge walk-in, you know, shower and closet and everything in the master has a huge pool and outdoor living space. And so it's its own attraction. People will go there just for that house. Just they want to go there for that. Yeah. I want to go there for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So you've been known to say it's easier to do a $10 million deal than it is to do a hundred thousand dollar deal. Why is that true for you? Why is that true for you? That's a great, I like your structure of questions. So it is true for me because <laughs> I, I hear Chris Voss when you say that. It's true I don't for even me. Know that is. Oh, the negotiation guy. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's true for me because when I think back, I, I make this analogy to my coaching students, which is Tiger Woods doesn't need another set of golf clubs, but every company in the world would send him whatever he wants, whatever pants, whatever shirts, whatever clubs, whatever car, whatever, like it doesn't matter. It's Tiger Woods, right? So when we need something, it's harder to get. And once we have it, it's easier to get almost in the way that we, we, we attract more than what we even need. And so in the, in the case of like the first hundred thousand dollar deal or the, you know, tenth hundred thousand dollar deal, you have a seller who's broke and you have a, you know, wholesaler who needs to make their, you know, money by tomorrow and you have a title company that has some issue. When you get into these larger deals, you're dealing with professionals and dealing with a professional situation and there's less competition. So I, I've just found it to be true. And you know what's funny too? I'll say I think it's easier, excuse me, to get like a Two million dollar or five million dollar loan than it is to get a hundred thousand dollar loan because you haven't proved that you can handle the hundred thousand dollars, and if you're getting a two million dollar loan, you've already proven that you can handle that. A hundred percent. Yep. And also, you know, just looking at a deal structure and deal underwriting, the bank that wants that deal versus that hard money lender who's lending you your first hundred thousand dollars on your first first deal, and it's not to like look down on doing small deals. We, we buy those little tiny houses all the time or low price houses because you know what? Uh, It's a great burr strategy, you know, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, put it in my portfolio. So I'll do that all day because I can do it in my sleep and I don't have to worry about it. But when we can go make literally net seven figures plus in one transaction or one deal, then, you know, it's an outsized return for for the level of output. What set you up to make that deal happen? Well, uh, one of the things I talk about all the time is networking and making relationships. And uh, I call them million dollar calls. And I say like, have a million dollar call a week. Make a new relationship this week, not because you're greedy or not because you expect them to give you a million dollars. I call it that because we want to make the time that you spend valuable. And also honoring the time of the other person that you're spending it with. And so I call it a million dollar call. It might be a wholesaler. It might be a lender. It might be a potential partner. It might be a money lender. There's infinite relationships and it it just depends on what you need and or what problem you're solving or what problem, you know, Kayla might reach out and say, hey, I love that you do Airbnb. Let's joint venture on one, you know, out here in California. Or, you know, somebody hears something on here and they, they're smart. I'm going to do that now, Nathan. (laughs) It's, it's on. I I already have it. I bring the operations to you, my friend. We can do it. That's what it is, right? It's making relationships. It's the highest possible 
opportunity in my view is relationships and it goes both ways. You either feed it and grow it or you, it's something that you, it, it goes away, right? We have to feed these relationships and build them and, and take our, and also honor our time as people, investors, whatever, that we make sure we utilize our time in a, in a way that is honoring those, you know, eight or 10 or 12 or however many hours you're going to work. I love that. And I think a lot of people listening in right now, they haven't learned how to value their time. Like I mm -hmm. always tell people, I don't work for free anymore because I've done enough where I don't need to work for free anymore. And in the beginning, I feel like if you don't know anything, you don't have the relationship, sometimes you should put in that that sweat equity and work for free because it's the relationships, the experience you're going to get, it's going to be worth it. But now I'm like, I charge what I charge because I charge what I charge. And I just stand in that. And I want everybody to get to that level and know that their time is worth something. What would you say? And it sounds like you're at that level too, where you know what you bring to the table. What can people do to get to that space and like, you know, stand and go, okay, if I have 30 minutes, I'm going to make this work. And I'm not going to like spend two hours with somebody because I feel like I need to prove myself to them. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, I have the same, same feeling and, and people, if you, if you're reaching out to someone and say like, Hey, I want to take you to coffee or I want to take you to lunch or whatever, like you have to understand from the other side perspective, like that's a lot of time to go and, and spend that time doing coffee. And most of the time, here's the truth. Most of the time, those people are just a giant waste of time. And that's just the honest truth. They're not going to do anything. They want to, they want to spend time and tell you all their problems, but they don't do anything. And so, uh, I have a Facebook group. So we have just shy of 13,000 members in our Facebook group. And so if somebody sends me a message, I'll say, sweet, Kayla, uh, thanks so much for your message. It means a lot that you thought of me go post in the group so we can help a thousand other people with the two and tag me and I'll respond. Also, if it's someone who then comes back and does exactly what I just said, they actually post it. They actually tag me. They have a thoughtful question. I'm like, okay, this person Coachable. actually did some coachable. So they post that. They send another message, say a month later. And they're like, Nathan, thank you so much for the help. This is really helpful. I had this and this and this come up. Awesome. I'm going to respond to you because you know what? You had a very clear question. You weren't, it wasn't like a waste of time. It wasn't an unclear request where you haven't already processed what you're trying to do, that's totally different. So if you want somebody's help, have a clear plan, have a clear understanding of what you're asking for, be prepared, have notes, be grateful, pay, offer to pay them. Uh, offer, like lunch doesn't matter to me. I'd rather you make a, a $250 donation to a veterans community project and help somebody get off the street than like taking me to lunch. I don't care. Those things, like what's important to me? What's important to you, Kayla? What's important to the person you're talking to? Do some homework. Yes. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Do homework. Like under, I hate when I get those messages and it's like, you have no idea. Like you haven't looked at my last like 10 posts. And if you did, you wouldn't even be asking this question right now. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So when people do do their homework, it, it shows and you stand out and then, you know, I'm going to help you next time because you've shown that you're like a hard worker and you're coachable. So, so good to point out. Now, I think a lot of people, they get in, everybody wants to be a real estate investor, everybody, because they know rich people invest in real estate, you know? So it's like, I want that, but they don't understand as you become a real estate investor, you're, you're a business owner. And those two go hand in hand if you like, and you have to be a powerful business owner in order to be a successful real estate investor. You know, you're doing more than three homes a year. And what would you say are your strengths as an investor that helped you be a successful business owner today? Love it. Uh, and I'd like to give you a two for one on that question. And I'll tell you my weaknesses also. Yes. By the way, here we are on a podcast. I also take notes, everybody. We <laughs> like, it's not, it's not difficult. <laughs> so strengths. I would say I'm, I'm good at coming up with a vision oftentimes further than what other people can see. So I, I like the visionary seat. I like, I like holding responsibility that feels 
dangerous for other people, like getting on stage or talking in front of thousands of people or getting in front of a camera, those things. I like the, um, I like the pressure. I like the, the demand and like the caps, like getting on stage and playing music or getting on stage and speaking. There's something really amazing about it, but from a specific tactical real estate, I'm great at underwriting. I'm great at finding deals. I am horrendously bad with details. I despise running all the processes, although I've grown to really appreciate these things, which I did not five or 10 years ago. And also in weakness, you know, a strong visionary type, which I love all the visionaries out there and everybody's like, well, no, bro, every, like, does you don't know how much I can see and vision and I have a hundred great ideas. Like, great, fine, I'm sure you do. So do I and so does Kayla and so does everybody else listening to this podcast. Doesn't matter. Like slow down and solve one problem. And so the weakness is having, having so many ideas but not being truly focused on really accomplishing one thing. I think for people to think about what is their strength, like weakness side, also what does it take for me to either cover myself with someone else in my business that's good at this or how do I have a recognition first of all and understand how to um, turn that either into somebody else covering it or to get better at it. Yeah. Becoming self-aware of here is where I suck and here's what I do really well. And so on that note, we've got to be willing to find people that are better than us (laughs) and like put the ego aside and say, this person's going to help me. So how have you been able to find good talent in your business? You know, the clearest and best I've ever been is when I am clearest on the goal of the business, when I am the most clear on the core values that I have in the business and what that represents, and I get out of my own way. Those are the three, like, if you're in your own way, strong people won't stick because they they want to have opportunity. They want to hold that responsibility. If you don't have a clear direction where you're going, then people, the, those valuable people who want to stick around and be a part of something special, like why does somebody go to work at Amazon or work at Garmin or work at Google or, you know, Twitter or whatever, build rockets and, you know, hang out with Elon. Why do they do that and work 16 hours a day? Because they're fired up about the mission, right? So we make the mission clear. And then I would also say, you know, when you think about core values, which is the third one I mentioned, it's, it's so much easier to get upset. Like Kayla, you're, it seems like you're lazy, you know, versus Kayla, we had a responsibility of doing X calls this week and this many houses under contract and integrity is one of our core values. And it feels like you're out of integrity to the business for holding your responsibility. It's a totally different conversation. Absolutely. Because in that the the latter conversation is an empowering one because you're allowing people to take radical acceptance over over their results. And so when people realize, like the coachable people who are going to really grow, they'll go, okay, you know, what can I do to increase my integrity? And they start to grow as a person. And those are the best types of people you want inside of your company. Absolutely. And let me be clear too, as a leader, I'm not perfect. Like I screw this stuff up still. I'll get frustrated or I'll get fired up and all of a sudden, you know, I'm not in a hundred percent of what I wanted to expect of someone else. And so here's the other thing as a leader or of yourself or anybody else is to take personal responsibility too. And if you screw up, which you will, then you own it and you tell everyone and you, and you make it right. And so we don't expect people to be perfect. We expect them to be honest and hold themselves accountable. And committed to growth too. That's so important. Now you said you do best when you have that clear vision. What is your clear vision right now? You know, where are you, what are you building your company to? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? There's a lot of questions in there. So you could just talk and take away, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try to be specific. So I, I come back to your question. Uh, so it's, you know, that listening thing, it's, it's complicated. So as far as my my actual vision for what I want is I want to have enough money that I can give away a million dollars a year in perpetuity for 
education uh, for arts and kids around education. So it could be the art classroom. It could be the music classroom or whatever. And I just distinctly remember like lots of kids can go play sports, but there's also lots of kids that want to go do like cool art stuff and, and instruments or whatever. And that kid wants to play violin and they can't afford it. Like I cannot wait to solve that problem. So I'm, I'm fired up about that on the real estate side. You know, early on, I thought about like making a million dollars a year, uh, was important and certainly making, making money is great, but I have actually changed the active income part. And I don't really even think about the active income as much anymore. I actually, I think about a net worth and I think about cash flow and the building of both of those things. So to me, it's all about building my portfolio where I'm, I'm not selling. I, I made a post the other day that said, I'm not calling it buy and hold anymore. I'm calling it buy and gold. Ooh. Stop selling the most valuable thing. Which is cash flow. Is that what you're saying? Cash flow and equity. You know, cash flow has never made me rich, but time has. And it's like, if I call it buying gold, first of all, it like, uh, it, it makes me think like I'm, I'm, I'm triggered like, huh? Okay. And then that long-term vision is guess what? Now I, I can go on vacation, stuff like that with my family that like, this is not we're, we're past that part, but we homeschool. So we want to actually go spend three months in Columbia or three months in wherever. And, and just spending more time with the people you love and the family, whether they're blood or, or by, you know, friendship or whatever. And so I, I spend very little time thinking about that big, like dollar amount. And I think more, how can I buy my time back? So powerful. And I love that you're getting everybody that's listening in right now to start thinking about that. How, how can you get your time back? And I think real estate gets me so excited because it, it really is the fastest way, I believe in my opinion, to get your time back. And this is from somebody who used to be an ER nurse, you know, I, and I saw like the doctors who worked the least owned the most amount of real estate. And that's mm. when it first started to percolate in my mind, like, okay, I need to do what they're doing. <laughs> How do I get on their level? And so many people think that, you know, you need a lot of money in order to make that happen, what would you say to that person who's like, okay, that's nice for you, Nathan, but I don't know how I'm going to buy my time back because I don't have a lot of money to do that. So you set up one of my favorite of my lines perfectly. Don't make money your problem, make your problem your problem. So I think this is something over and over and over and over that we make the money the problem. And I understand money can feel I'm not immune to this. Like money can feel very disempowering if we don't feel like that there's something that we can do about it. But I'll give an example. So let's say you do all the work of learning about how to do a deal. You find a deal, you underwrite it. It looks good. It actually makes money. You have a clear plan. You have a contractor. You have a bid. You have everything laid out in what actually would happen. I will personally guarantee you you put that in any group on Facebook, you will have a hundred people like, wait, you have what? And you, you don't have the money? Like that's solved. We'll solve that. It's, it's when we get greedy. So, well, wait, you want 50% or 70% or whatever somebody you know, asks for? It's better than zero. So we, we keep putting these self-imposed walls in front of ourselves as opposed to saying, okay, awesome. Actually, let's go back to what Nathan said earlier about the the partnership and let's like, let's solve that problem. How do we do one deal together in a way that actually manifests what both of us want? And then how do we do that again and make a decision or tuck that money away or don't go blow it on some nonsensical thing that you just spent all your money on that doesn't matter. Like don't do those things, put that money back aside, go do another deal. As you can tell it, that's a hot button one for me. Don't make money your problem. Solve the problem. 
So powerful. And that's why, you know, to wrap this up, it's so important who you're listening to, who you're taking advice from, because if you really think that money is a problem, you're hanging out with the wrong people. You know, you're listening to the wrong people because exactly, you know, money is never the issue. And I'm in so many groups. I watch it happen all the time. People post deals and it's like, I go, cause I'm going, Oh, I want that one. And then I go, yeah. Oh man, it's already taken, <laughs> you know? So exactly. it's really, truly, but those people, you know, they, they're willing to put in that sweat equity and like put the deal together, which is so exciting. There's so much opportunity out there. So you have a book that just came out. It's called the no quitters guide, which I'm so excited because I want to give away 10 copies to our listeners today. So as you're listening to this right now, you got to take a screenshot of this episode. You got to tag both Nathan and I on social media. If you're watching this on YouTube. You see how, how awesome that book looks. I like that cover. Thank you. The no quitters guide. And you could tell just by his story. I mean, he had, he had reason to quit back in 2009, but he kept going and you know, you're listening in right now and you probably have a million reasons to quit as well, but you might have that one reason to keep going just like he did. And so, uh, Nathan, where can people find the book? What can they expect from the book? Absolutely. So you can, you can find the book anywhere books are sold, Amazon books, a million target Barnes and Noble. It's pretty cool. And what can you expect from the book? Well, the thing that the, the, my motivation was, I didn't want to just write another real estate book that was real estate 101 or fluff that rah, rah, gets you excited. I wanted to help with all my students. The biggest problem by far for every person is not a clear enough vision because, you know, I, I'm an avid hunter outdoorsman. So aside barring anyone's personal feelings about hunting, think of my husband's a huge hunter too. So people aren't used to that. <laughs> perfect. So I think about a rifle, right? So you have a rifle, you have a barrel, you have whatever the, the cartridge is, whatever the ammunition is. And you have all the things that are part of that mechanism that have to go right to put that one round on a target. And so the further the target gets away, the more complicated is the shot. We have to adjust for wind. We have to adjust for you know speed. And we have to adjust for how, how that bullet flies because it actually doesn't fly straight. It flies up and then goes down. So we have to make all these adjustments and pull the trigger, right? So like see, you see people buy a house and you're like, oh my gosh, how'd they do that? Or they made 20 grand or 50 grand. That was the impact, right? But there were all the steps that led up to that that we had to actually make clear. And so I wanted to write a book that said, let's start from the, from the end in mind and work all the way back. So let's talk about how we prepped to get on the mountain. Let's pr talk about how we like set up a shot. Same thing in real estate. What, let's set a clear vision. Let's actually tell, des describe the kind of business and what kind of job I want to do. What responsibility do I want to hold? What is my day-to-day -day look like? And then we have real estate 101 preparing to actually be successful because a lot of us sabotage our own success, which is crazy. So anyway, that's what I wrote the book about. And I wanted it to be something that was, if you had never experienced or, or heard about real estate investing, you could pick up my book. And by the end, you'd have a good idea of both what, if you do those things, creating a vision, making a plan, what kind of business, what kind of action will you take? Wow. Okay. Well, I'm super excited for everybody to get this book in their hands. So I want you guys to click the link right now, go and buy a couple books because I always feel like, you know, the people who do the best in life are givers. And so I want you guys to buy a couple books to give out to your friends because this book could actually change their life. So Nathan, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I feel like I have a million more questions, but you know, I, I know that we can talk on social media and people can go and follow you, join your groups, join your programs, all the good stuff that you have going on. So again, thank you so much for being on the show. I learned a lot about your vision. I'm going to go out there and get this book and make a new vision too. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.